day to all of you. Uh, we are here in Leuven for the second day of the master class on motility and functional disorders. Um, this is a Saturday. For some of you the day is already well advanced. I'm hoping you had a good day so far and we will do our best to provide some meaningful input to the rest of your day um, during this master class. So we are here on the right hand side and so we will be dealing with three sessions today. The first one will focus on bowel disorders, then there will be a break. Then we will have a session on practical guidance for managing patients with functional GI disorders and motility disorders. Then there will be another break and then we will deal with advanced aspects of functional GI disorders. There is a quiz built in into the second part on practical guidance. So I wish you a very warm welcome to day two of this master class. Um, and the first speaker is my colleague Tim van Uitsel, who will speak about probably the most prevalently managed condition in functional GI disorders and in GI practice in broad, the irritable bowel syndrome. Leuven Motility Masterclass. Indeed, I will discuss now the management of IBS in 2020. So, to start with the obvious, um, there are no biomarkers to diagnose irritable bowel syndrome. And so, this is why we have to rely on symptom criteria to make a diagnosis. This is not process. This has already started in the 80s with the Manning and the Kreuz criteria and this has then evolved to the Rome criteria, as you know, of which the latest and fourth iteration has been published in 2016. So the main symptom in the Rome 4 criteria is a recurrent abdominal pain. This is the condition that needs to be fulfilled in order to diagnose IBS. And so then there are three other conditions of which two have to be fulfilled to make a diagnosis of IBS. And these are all related to the stool pattern. So the first one is that there has to be a relation between the abdominal pain and the defecation. In most patients this will be an improvement after defecation. However, some patients, as you know, will also tell you that the pain may get a little bit worse after defecation or upon defecation and then improve afterwards. So also this is a signature of IBS. And then there can be an association between the uh, change in frequency, so less or more frequent, and a change in consistency, more or less loose, um, of the stool. So two out of, the, two out of three of these conditions have to be fulfilled together with the abdominal pain, the main criterion. There's a frequency criterion as well, so this has to be present for at least one day per week, and um, at the onset has to be at least six months um, before. So these are the wrong criteria and they're used in, in research, but nevertheless I think they're also useful in the clinical practice. For example, the association with the three stool related criteria is important to differentiate IBS from more difficult to treat conditions like um, centrally mediated abdominal pain syndrome or CAPS. For example, and I will come back to this in the last talk of today, um, an important difference here is that in patients with centrally mediated abdominal pain syndrome, where central hypersensitivity plays the most important role, is in that in this condition there is no connection between physiological events, it is eating or defecating, and the pain. The pain is always there no matter whether they eat or whether they defecate, um, it's there all the time, it's there day and night, um, and so this is very different. And so we know that in these patients, central hypersensitivity plays an important role, and so the treatment has to be directed towards these central mechanisms, like neuromodulators, psychotherapy, and so on. I think this illustrates that these wrong criteria are not just useful for research, but also in clinical practice. As Professor Tuck already alluded to, this is one of the most prevalent conditions in clinical practice of the gastroenterologist, and we know on population-based studies that this has a prevalence of 5 to 15 percent worldwide with huge variations. Um, for example, on, on, on this map you can see, for example, that the prevalence in Iran was about 1 percent and just next door, um, Pakistan, 45 percent. 
just to indicate you that there are huge differences depending on the questionnaire use, depending on the cultural um, background and so on. It's, it is the most frequent diagnosis that we make in our clinical practice, so about one in three patients will end up with a diagnosis of irritable bowel syndrome and of course there is a female predominance mainly in the younger age group and mainly in those patients who seek um, the help of a healthcare worker. It's costly, not only by physician visits, um, medical treatment, but also because of um, indirect costs like work loss and so on, absenteeism and presenteeism. And of course, there is a negative impact on quality of life. It is, um, you will not die from irritable bowel syndrome, but this comes with symptoms which can be severe in certain patients and of course this can impact on quality of life to an important extent. So these wrong criteria are useful but we have to be very careful because as you know also organic conditions like inflammatory bowel disease or even GI cancers can also fulfill these wrong criteria and so it is important to exclude a few organic disorders which can mimic IBS. So this is why Rome has recommended the stepwise approach. So you start with a thorough clinical history taking, you include the criteria, or you at least you have them at the back of your mind, um, then you perform a physical examination um, to, in, to, to check whether there is anything abnormal which could hint that there is something else going on, an organic condition. You order a couple of minimal laboratory tests, and in some patients you go for a colonoscopy. So, this is an algorithm, this is still um, from the Rome 3 era, but it still holds true in Rome 4. So you start with the clinical history taking and then you go and check whether there are any alarm features present. present. And the, these are the alarm features which can tell you whether this patient needs a more profound examination including um, colonoscopy. These red flags um, include weight loss, patients who have an onset of symptoms after the age of 50, when there is blood loss in the stools, patients with anemia, patients who wake up in the night with symptoms. Also being male can, can be considered a red flag because as you know that there is an increased prevalence in females, so there's always a little higher index of suspicion when a male patient comes to you with these kind of symptoms. When there is a familial history of colon cancer and inflammatory bowel disease and celiac disease, always think that this may be um, an expression of these disorders. When you find anything abnormal or physical examination, um, this can also be a red flag. So in these patients you do want a colonoscopy to make sure that you exclude these, these disorders and in certain cases also a, a gastroscopy to exclude celiac disease. However, it is not necessary to do a colonoscopy in all patients that present to you with symptoms suggesting irritable bowel syndrome. This is a study performing colonoscopy in IBS patients or patients fulfilling IBS criteria, let's say, and healthy controls. And they checked whether, um, what was the gain, the yield of a colonoscopy. And you don't need to do the colonoscopy to find polyps or cancers. Um, actually, what you can see in this um, table is that patients with IBS had less polyps compared to controls. Of course, as you can imagine, this is not because IBS is protective for GI cancer or polyps. This is because the um, control population was taken from an endoscopy population. These were patients who came for follow-up of polyps or patients uh, with a familial history of GI cancers. Also, the controls were significantly older, were more likely to be male and so on. But still, it does show you that patients with IBS do not have, or patients who fulfill IBS criteria, do not have an increased risk of polyps or cancer. Of course, what we're also worried about is to miss inflammatory bowel disease or microscopic colitis. But looking at this entire population, more than 450 patients fulfilling IBS criteria, you see that the diagnosis of IBS based on the symptom criteria was not changed in the overall majority of patients, more than 98%. However, of course, you will still miss, even if it's a limited number of patients, you will still miss a few IBD patients and I will come back to this later on how this can be solved. Celiac disease is another organic condition which you know is a chameleon disease and it can present like IBS, can present even with constipation, um, with very specific symptoms and so on. 
And this is why um, it has been checked whether patients fulfilling IBS criteria are more likely to end up with a diagnosis of celiac disease. And indeed, looking into this patient population, you see that there is a five-fold increased prevalence of celiac disease in patients fulfilling IBS criteria compared to a uh, control population. Um, however, this is not true in all studies. So studies originating from the US did not show this increased prevalence. And of course, it also depends on the background prevalence. It has been shown that if the background prevalence where you live is more than 0.5%, so more than 1 in 200, then it is cost effective to screen for celiac disease. Um, and even if not, um, even if it's not cost effective, the patient who's sitting in front of you um, if there is a patient with diarrhea predominant IBS, in my opinion, you should exclude celiac disease uh, because there is a relatively easy treatment, not for the patient, but it is a well-established treatment to, to treat celiac disease and to um, help the patient get rid of the symptoms. So I think you should screen for it. So this is why in the algorithm, those patients without alarm features, um, you need to run just a few simple tests. And what we recommend is to do a fecal calprotectin. As you know, this is a sensitive test to diagnose inflammation at the level of the colon to exclude IBD in those patients who are um, younger than 50 years old. In those older, as we discussed, you do a colonoscopy. You check for inflammation with CRP, you do a complete blood count, you check for anemia, and you can include celiac serology based on the background prevalence in your country and um, the presentation of symptoms. But beware, even patients with um, constipation can have a diagnosis of celiac disease, as you know that one in five celiacs will present with constipation only. So then, when you make a diagnosis of IBS, the next step is that you go for the subclassification. And based on the Bristol stool form scale, um, you can determine whether this is a patient with diarrhea predominant IBS, Bristol stool form scale six or seven, or constipation predominant IBS, Bristol stool form scale one or two. These um, little cards showing the different types of stools are actually quite useful in clinical practice and I like to show this to my patients and um, you would be surprised and probably you're already aware that patients really love to indicate how their stool pattern is from day to day and I must say that I prefer this type of drawings um, above the more recent trends that patients are showing me um, photographs of their stools. So I would recommend you to use the Bristol stool form scale. So based on the stool pattern, you can make the subtyping um, of IBS and the cutoff here is 25% of the bowel movements. So if more than 25% of the bowel movements is Bristol stool from scale 6 or 7, this is IBSD. If it's more than 25% type 1 or type 2, it's IBSC. If it's more than 25% of both, this is the mixed um, form of IBS. So how do we treat these patients? Um, as I told you, there are both central mechanisms, including um, central hypersensitivity and peripheral mechanisms. And both of these can be targeted pharmacologically or non-pharmacologically. However, the first step in all of these patients is to tackle um, the, 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 the background of the patient, to do a thorough history taking, and then to proceed with education on mechanisms of IBS on the background of a good patient-physician relationship. And Professor Tuck will um, come back to this later on in the communication talk. This is important, um, that there is a good interaction between the patient and the physician. We all know this, but this has also been investigated in this study from Mayo Clinic, where they analyzed videotape uh, recordings of the conversations between patients and physicians. And what they showed was that the stronger the interaction was between the patient and the physician, the less likely the patients were um, to, re to come back with ongoing symptoms. So the less likely they were to be refractory um, um, to, the, to the treatment that was started. And looking into the individual components which could contribute to the lack of response, they found that discussion of psychosocial history, discussion on pathophysio pathophysiology and a diagnosis of IBS, looking at precipitating factors like depression, anxiety and so on, um, could all contribute to an improved outcome. However, you can also see that um, reassurance didn't seem to work. 
and this is a bit counterintuitive because we also think that if you tell a patient everything's fine, don't worry, there's nothing organic going on, you will not die from this, that the patient is better. However, it, is, it seems that this is not the case. The problem is that often what is considered as reassurance is that you do a couple of tests and you tell the patient everything's fine, nothing's, nothing's wrong, you can go home and relax. However, this doesn't work, as you will see in a later talk. Because the patient, of course, is still bothered by the symptoms. You have to recognize that these symptoms are there. If you say that everything is perfectly fine, the patient will lose confidence. The patients will think that maybe you missed something. You, you neglect the symptoms, you have to do other tests. Um, he doesn't feel understood, he or she. Um, he, he still can't eat or drink. What is going on? There must be something going on. It's important to make a positive diagnosis and you tell the patient, well, um, based on what you are saying to me, the diagnosis is irritable bowel syndrome. We will run a few tests to, to exclude organic disorders, but in my opinion, the chance of having irritable bowel syndrome is quite high and then we will establish a treatment for this. But don't say everything is normal, because everything is not normal. The patient has symptoms and this is IBS. Then the next step is that um, you focus on the predominant symptom of this patient in irritable bowel syndrome and you address this specific symptom in your treatment choice. Because of course, patients can be very different and the main symptom can be diarrhea, constipation, abdominal pain and bloating. And there's a whole multitude of um, treatment options that can be used to tackle diarrhea, constipation, pain and bloating. I will not go through all of them. Um, but I will highlight a few which can be important for your clinical practice. One of the less familiar ones may be, for example, cholestyramine. Cholestyramine is a bile acid binding resin, and the reason why this can be useful in patients fulfilling IBS criteria is that studies have shown that one third of patients fulfilling the IBS diarrhea predominant subtype criteria actually have a diagnosis of bioacid malabsorption rather than IBS. And so it can be useful to treat these patients with a bioacid binding resin. So how do you diagnose um, bioacid malabsorption? You can do this with a bioacid breath test, however this is not widely available. And then we usually include a 72 hour feces collection to measure the labeled bile acids in the feces. You can do a CCAT test where this is a scintigraphy test where you check the um, retaining of a labeled bile acid in the body after seven days. Or you can also start a trial with cholestyramine or cholecephalam. The latter is often better tolerated and seems to be more efficacious, although no head-to-head -head studies are available. However, be aware that the um, tolerance um, of these drugs is not great. Many patients will feel a bit bloated, so I do recommend to make a diagnosis prior to start a treatment if you suspect IBS, um, if you suspect that bile acid malabsorption may play a role in these patients. One of the non-pharmacological um, treatments that can be used both for diarrhea and constipation, but mainly for constipation, is fiber. Um, what is a fiber? Fiber are non-absorbed carbohydrates which will end up in the colon and will be fermented. And fiber is beneficial indeed because they will lead to bulking of the stool and hence accelerate transit time. And by the fermentation there will be a production of short-chain fatty acids. And these short-chain fatty acids will change the luminal pH, will um, change the microbiota in a be beneficial direction, um, this is also a source of the um, an energy source for your um, colonocytes, so these are all beneficial effects. However, you need to be aware that also through this process of fermentation, there is also production of methane, hydrogen gas and CO2. And so this gas production can lead to bloating, flatulence and pain. And so this is what um, we call the fiber paradox, which means that fiber can be useful especially in patients with constipation predominant IBS but we often see patients who are eating so much fiber that actually the fiber is um, maintaining some of their symptoms bloating, abdominal distension, flatulence and so on. Also there's difference between soluble and insoluble fibers for example the insoluble fiber bran um, we know that this is not effective in treating IBS as you can see in the meta-analysis 
in contrast to soluble fibers like psyllium or ispagula, which is the same, um, these have an effect in patients mainly with constipation predominant IBS, but also sometimes in patients with diarrhea predominant IBS um, as well. Low FODMAP diet is an, is an other very efficacious treatment for patients with IBS and this can tackle diarrhea, pain and bloating, but I will not discuss this. My colleague um, Karen will discuss this in the next talk. Antibiotics. Um, we know that the microbiota are changed in patients with irritable bowel syndrome. There is a hypothesis of small bowel, um, intest um, small intestinal bacterial overgrowth as well, and antibiotics may play a role there in the treatment. And one of the most efficacious um, antibiotic treatments in this perspective is rifaximin. Rifaximin is a non-absorbed um, antibiotic which stays in the lumen, um, has a very broad spectrum and has been investigated in patients with IBS in these two target trials published in the New England Journal of Medicine. This was a two-week treatment trial with rifaximin 550 milligrams three times daily and then there was a follow-up um, period of three months. So what you can see, even if the benefit of rifaximin over placebo was limited, this was statistically significant and so there may be a role for rifaximin in certain patients with IBS. The problem is that so far we don't know which patients are the best candidates to be treated with rifaximin. That's one problem. The other problem is that most patients will need more than one treatment. And this has been addressed in this follow-up study where actually indeed they showed that two-thirds of the patients who responded to rifaximin actually needed another retreatment over the next 18 weeks. In this trial they were re-randomized to have rifaximin or placebo and at every retreatment indeed there was still a difference between um, rifaximin at the bottom, so a better decrease in symptoms compared to placebo, the curve on top. However, in, again, the difference with placebo seems to be limited. For constipation, the obvious answer would be to start an osmotic laxative. However, be aware that indeed laxatives like polyethylene glycol will decrease the number of bowel movements per week, but there is no change in pain level. So this will only address one symptom of IBSC, but will not address the main symptom. More advanced treatment of constipation predominant IBS include lubiprostone and linaclotide, but I will discuss this in the lecture on functional constipation. So, the bottom line is to treat diarrhea and constipation is not so difficult. Um, by combining treatments, by increasing the dose, in most patients we are able to address these symptoms. However, the pain and the bloating, these are the most difficult symptoms to address and this is what we would call the real deal in, in treating patients with IBS. A first line treatment there is the um, antispasmodics including peppermint oil. Uh, this is a study using otilonium bromides um, which is um, classical antispasmodic with NK2 um, antagonistic effects as well. This will also be discussed in a um, recent trial com compared to diet by Karen. Um, this is the OBIS trial. So this is a randomized controlled trial um, in Rome to confirmed IBS patients. This was a 15-week trial. And what you can see is at the end of the 15-week period there was a um, decrease, a more profound decrease in the frequency of abdominal pain, not the severity, but the frequency of the abdominal pain in patients with otolonium bromide compared to placebo. And after the treatment is stopped after 15 weeks, you still see that even in the 10 weeks afterwards, there is still a difference between those who were treated before with otolonium compared to placebo. So there seems to be a prolonged effect in these patients. Other spasmolytics include medbevarin, um, which is also significantly better than placebo, and peppermint oil as well. So this is what I would call the first line treatment. Some novel um, therapies um, which are on the horizon and could be used in future clinical practice is, for example, Ebastin. Ebastin is a um, blocker of the H1 um, histamine receptor 1, and this is work by our colleague Guy Buxtans, who is also in Leuven, and what he found was that these um, submucosal neurons in colonic biopsies of patients with IBS were hyperreactive to, to capsaicin, which is trip one agonist, compared to biopsies of healthy volunteers. 
And remarkably, this seems to be dependent on histamine, because when a histamine receptor 1 blocker, pyrilamine, was added, you see that the increased reactivity of the supernatants in this case was decreased in these experiments, and when you add histamine to the supernatants of healthy volunteers, then you see an increased reactivity of the um, neurons, indicating that histamine may play a role, and this was then taken further into a treatment trial, and ibestin, so the histamine receptor 1 antagonist, was um, tested in this um, placebo control trial. Three month trial and indeed you see that um, the percentage of patients with at least considerable relief was significantly higher in those patients being treated with ibestin compared to placebo. And this is now being tested in a phase 3 um, multicenter trial. Antidepressants or neuromodulators I will only address briefly because I will come back to this in a talk later today. But the bottom line is that for overall IBS symptoms, including discomfort, bloating, and so on, there doesn't seem to be a, a difference, an important difference between tricyclics and the selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors. However, for pain-specific um, treatment, those patients where pain is predominant, and these are many patients, only the tricyclics seem to be effective in these meta-analyses. In patients where the classical neuromodulators, like tricyclics or SSRIs, are not effective, you can go for augmentation therapy. And I will explain this later on. But one of the therapies which can be useful in patients with IBS are alpha-2 delta ligand agents, like pregabalin, so an, an old uh, epilepsy drug. In this trial, a rather high dose of pregabalin was used, so 225 milligrams TID. I would recommend to start lower, definitely 75 milligrams BID. Um, but in this trial you see indeed that the pain scores were lower in patients with IBS being treated with pregabalin compared to placebo. Alternative treatments um, addressing the central um, mechanisms include hypnotherapy and cognitive behavioral therapy. Good effects in meta-analysis, however mainly all studies with number needed to treat of 3 or 4. The problem is that in many countries there are not enough dedicated therapists for CBT and hypnotherapy and also that there is no good reimbursement for these um, therapies either. This is one study of hypnotherapy to show you that there in, indeed there is this is really promising treatment and should probably be used more often. This was a treatment of 10 treatment um, regime of 10 sessions of hypnotherapy over the course of three months and then there was a one-year follow-up. And what you can see both in terms of physical and psychological well-being is that even one year after the end of the hypnotherapy sessions, those with the gut-directed hypnotherapy were better off than those who had the standard medical therapy. So this seems to be useful in um, at least a certain subtype of patients. Cognitive behavioral therapy, both the standard and the minimal contact cognitive behavioral therapy are more effective than the standard IBS education, which is here um, depicted in um, white. And this also even one year after the completion of the CBT treatment. So this is quite interesting because even with three sessions of minimal contact cognitive behavioral therapy, one year later, there is still a difference compared to those patients who underwent a standard education on IBS. But the lack of dedicated therapists is a problem. Going back to the um, microbiota hypothesis, um, one question we often get is what is the role of probiotics? And there is a meta-analysis putting all the probiotics together and I'm showing you this not so you can see the evidence, but to show you that there is a lot. What I mean is there are different combinations of bacteria. There is Lactobacillus bifidobacterium, Escherichia, there are also yeast like Saccharomyces. And unfortunately in all these meta-analyses, all of these effects are combined together. Um, and all combined, there seems to be an effect which is superior to placebo. However, this doesn't make any sense. We also don't combine all medical treatments of IBS in one meta-analysis. So I think it's important to look at individual types of probiotics and look at the evidence available for that time. Because of the high variability in quality of trials, species, doses, strains, delivery forms, and so on. So this is also why there are no claims approved by EFSA um, uh, and by FDA, and that this is not recommended in the, um, in the 
American um, College of Gastroenterology guidelines. So looking at individual probiotics, this is the Bifidobacterium infantis uh, 35624. Um, this was tested against a lactobacillus um, for a treatment period of eight weeks and indeed you see that the symptoms were um, reduced to a higher extent with the B. infantis compared to placebo and the lactobacillus. And with this particular strain there was mechanistic evidence behind this, also bloating was lower. And the mechanistic evidence was that there was that the ratio between IL-10, which is anti-inflammatory, and IL-12, which is pro-inflammatory, was increased um, with the B. infantis. So this seems to be an anti-inflammatory mechanism. And then finally, if probiotics are not the best, why don't we do a fecal microbiota transplantation? I'm showing you just this study from um, Yenti University in Belgium, where they indeed showed that um, three weeks after a ren randomized trial where the FMT was um, compared with um, transplant of their own stools that at 12 weeks patients um, had less IBS related symptoms, had less bloating. This is good news. However, after one year most of these patients relapsed. So there is some evidence that FMT may play a role in future treatment of IBS. However, um, I just want to show you another trial similar design, however with a um, more frequent FMT. So these were patients who were being treated for 12 days, who had 50 grams of um, frozen feces taken in orally. So these were 25 capsules of 2 grams of their own feces or uh, feces of a healthy super donor. And indeed the microbiota profile in those who underwent FMT was more resembling the donor compared to those who had placebo. And there was indeed a difference between um, FMT and um, getting back their own stools. However, those who had the FMT with their own stools were better off than those who had the FMT of the healthy donor. Indicating that it's too early. This is not ready for prime time yet. This is not ready for treatment in IBS patients. Definitely more research is needed. So this was an overview of the different treatments that can be used in IBS and happy to take any questions. Yes, yeah, so um, we did already get some questions through the internet for those who did not um, who did not yet do so. You can use the green button or uh, pop up in your lower screen to send in questions. I will start off with a question for myself um, and then I will go to some of the internet questions. Well, how long do you need to give these treatments? Because there's a variety of treatments. Is there a standard duration before you declare failure or success? Or Does it vary highly between treatments? That's a, that's a very good treatment. For example, a very good question, sorry. For example, we know that for the spasmolytic drugs, that most of the evidence um, around, that the difference is mainly there after three months, especially for otolonium bromide. We see that you need to, to treat patients and keep treating the patient for at least three months before you can um, deem this a failure. Um, but indeed this depends on the treatment. If for example you go for a neuromodulator therapy, we do recommend if there is a response that you continue for at least six months and, and also there you do want to wait at least three months before you can say that this treatment has failed. Is there one which you consider short acting, rapid acting, so that maybe two weeks and you know whether it will work or not? Is there anything like that within the spectrum? Yeah, so we know, for example, peppermint oil. So there is evidence that um, the peppermint oil has an acute spasmolytic effect as well. Um, it has been used in, um, in, in Japan, for example, during colonoscopy, where you see an acute relaxation of the smooth muscle. Um, so there, there is an acute effect of this as well and similar data are there for mebeverin as well, so there is an, an acute effect of these treatments as well, but to have the full effect you need to continue the treatment for a longer time. Then a question that came through the web, how many times can you really repeat rifaximin? Is there any guidance, any knowledge? So, so far the evidence is there until um, three treatments. Um, we don't use rifaximin, so I don't have much experience. But I, to be honest, if you have to repeat rifaximin three, four times over the course of one year, I don't think this is the best treatment for you. Also, when you look at the efficacy and you compare this to placebo and you look at the number of patients that were necessary to show statistical significance in these studies, 
I don't think this is the best treatment option for your IBS patients. Mm -hmm. Then a question that asks for the position of gabapentin. So it actually asks, the question phrased is, are there any studies that have looked at the use of gabapentin for pain control in patients who failed tricyclics or SSRIs? Yeah, so we used gabapentin a lot because there was a problem with reimbursement of pregabalin, which has changed now. Um, in my personal experience, it seems that pregabalin is more effective than gabapentin, but as far as I'm aware, there are no data um, of gabapentin and IBS. Uh, but maybe, Professor Tak, do you know if there's data on gabapentin in IBS specifically? I don't think so. No, I don't think we have these data. Um, in my clinical practice, I kind of use it in the fashion that the question was asked. So, go for better known neuromodulators, try a tricyclic for instance, and when that has not worked, then you go to pregabalin or gabapentin. Yes, absolutely. But I also do it like this, tricyclic, and then I usually add pregabalin. But in my opinion, it seems that pregabalin is a bit more effective than gabapentin, but as I said, this is just based on my experience. Mm. Then the question is about, so you broke up the symptoms in pain, bloating, um, um, constipation and diarrhea, but almost by definition. Um, IBS is a conglomerate of these. So do you go yes. for combination therapy? Do you ever do that? Or mm -hmm. do you step up, start one, add the second one? Yep. How do you do this in practice? That's an excellent question indeed because, like you say, if you ask what are your symptoms, you will see that most of these patients will have more than one of them. However, I do ask my patients what is the most predominant symptom. If I could help you with one symptom first, what, which one would that be? And as I said last time when I was discussing the overlap, um, I always start with monotherapy. And then I see them back after two to three months, depending on the treatment like we discussed. And, and then you see what, what is remaining of the other symptoms. And then indeed you go for combo therapy. For example, if the pain is still there, there is some relief with, the, um, with spasmolytic drugs, but there is still some pain, then you can uh, for example, at a tricyclic as well. Um, when I see the patient for the first time, I do recommend, for example, that they can take loperamide in case of diarrhea predominant IBS as kind of rescue treatment. Not systematically, because this can often increase bloating and abdominal distension, um, but as a type of rescue therapy, this can be combined, for example, with spasmolytic drugs as well. So, um what do you think about herbal therapy of IBS as an additional strategy? That also came through the web. Mm -hmm. Herbal? Yeah, herbal therapy. There, there, there is. I, I presented you peppermint oil. Um, so essential oil of peppermint. This, this is useful. Um, this is a spasmolytic drug, classical spasmolytic, spasm, spasmolytic drug, and there's also um, um, some antagonistic effects on trip channels as well, which can be involved in, in reducing pain. So there's definitely a role for herbal therapy as well. You alluded to it, but somebody asked when to use fiber in IBS diarrhea. I think to some people this might sound a little bit perplexing, so can you explain this? Yeah, so um, what we sometimes see is that patients with diarrhea predominant IBS, they have very frequent defecation um, with, with only a limited number of, um, of volume, so limited volume of stools, and then fiber in diarrhea predominant IBS can help to, to bulk the stool and to reduce the stool frequency and to improve the consistency of the stool as well. Also patients who experience some incontinence from time to time, fiber can help there to um, to increase the bulk of the stool and to normalize the stool pattern. I have two more questions that I would like to address. I think they're both important, but maybe can be addressed shortly um, in the interest of time. First question, how about mesalazine in IBSD? Yeah, so mesalazine has been tested in um, two large randomized controlled trials. However, the summary is that these trials were negative. In one of the trials, in the one post hoc analysis, there seemed to be a signal that there could be a role for mesalazine, but broadly um, speaking, these trials are negative. So mesalazine doesn't seem to be the future for IBS. And a difficult question, I think, should we consider hydrogen breath testing for IBS patients? 
So this goes back then again to the hypothesis of small intestinal bacterial overgrowth and bottom line is that this is quite controversial and this doesn't seem to predict for example the um, the, the, the response to antibiotics. So in general at this moment I would not recommend hydrogen breath testing in, in most IBS patients. There are exceptions but I wouldn't do this in everyone. There's a couple of more questions that we didn't address. We can keep them and get back to them later on but uh, maybe I will have you present the next speaker. Okay, so now we go to a very important topic. So I discussed pharmacological and non-pharmacological treatments for IBS, um, but in the last couple of years we discovered and we, that diet is also quite important in not just treating IBS but also other functional GI conditions. And Karen van den Houten, um, one of our great PhD students, will present um, the evidence that's available in literature and also some unpublished evidence from our lab as well. Karen. Thank you for this uh, introduction and indeed today I will talk about uh, diet in irritable bowel syndrome and also other functional gastrointestinal disorders and conditions. So probably you already have seen um, publicity similar to the ones shown on this slide um, where you see that food has uh, an impact on symptoms and where it's discussed the impact of food on symptoms. Um, it's just to show you that uh, it's very, a very hot topic, um, the relation between food or diets um, and symptoms in functional gastrointestinal disorders. So based on an online survey, um, which was filled out by mo more than 1,000 participants, 40% of the participants indicated dietary factors um, as, um, which leads to an increase in their symptoms. Um, based on this survey, the patients uh, with irritable bowel syndrome um, symptoms um, said also, reported also to, um, uh, to use dietary adjustments for their symptom, um, to reduce their symptoms. Some examples are shown on the slide here. So um, they go for a change in their water and fiber intake. The fiber intake is already discussed earlier today, but they also avoid fatty foods or reduce uh, the quantity of food intake. Um, only 23% of uh, patients with IBS indicated uh, in this uh, survey do, to not um, change their dietary uh, habits. Um, and, um, after a fasting period, um, healthy volunteers and patients with irritable bowel syndrome were served a standardized uh, breakfast and um, before the breakfast and also 30 minutes after the breakfast until tw uh, 240 minutes after breakfast, they were asked to score visual analog scales um, for their gastrointestinal symptoms. And as you see on the left graph, um, the healthy volunteers did not um, have any um, gastrointestinal symptoms except then for a change in fullness. Um, but the patients with uh, IBS on the right side of the slide, they um, had significant increases in the gastrointestinal, showed significant increases in the gastrointestinal symptoms compared to um, the healthy volunteers. Except for nausea, all were significant. So today we will um, talk about the use of dietary interventions in functional gastrointestinal disorders. So we will focus on food intolerance and triggers, but also on food uh, allergy. We will start with the food intolerance and triggers. So first of all, um, I would like to focus on carbohydrates, which are also called the FODMAPs, and later on um, discuss gluten um, or wheat. So as you see on this slide, um, already in the past, there were several reports um, indicated the effect of the different kind of FODMAPs on symptoms, which also leads to different kind of diets. And in general, the term um, FODMAPs, fermentable oligo monosaccharides and polyols. So as I said before, the FODMAPs, so the fermentable oligo monosaccharides and polyols, um, they, you can find them in different kinds of foods, uh, in fruits, in vegetables, but also in bread, in pasta, um, and also others as indicated on the slide. 
Some uh, examples are fructose, um, fructans, lactose, and also well-known. Um, the FODMAPs, they lead to symptoms in patients with uh, gastrointestinal, um, a higher symptom score in patients with um, functional gastrointestinal disorders because, um, or often due to a lack of the um, digestive enzyme, um, as for example, uh, less activity of lactase um, in splitting uh, lactose in glucose and galactose. This is the mechanism of action of those FODMAPs. So those small um, carbohydrates are not absorbed in the small intestine. They go directly to the colon, where they attract water due to their osmotic activity. They also lead to an increase in the gas production due to fermentation by colonic bacteria, which then leads to luminal distension, altered motility, and leads to symptoms as pain, bloating, distension, flatulence, but also constipation and diarrhea, two of the most um, common, yeah, two of the uh, subtypes in IBS patients. The, low, the effect of the low FODMAP diet on symptoms is already well discussed uh, previously. Um, so um, here, uh, the low FODMAP diet was compared to a high FODMAP diet. And as you can see um, on the symptom severity, the low FODMAP diet reduced the symptom severity significantly, while the high FODMAP diet did not change symptom severity or even worsen the symptom severity. In this trial, they also looked at histamine levels in urine. Um, as you see, um, based on the low FODMAP diet, there was a significant reduction in histamine, while um, based on the high FODMAP uh, diet, they could not find a significant difference on the histamine levels. This is a trial where they also looked at the effect of the FODMAP diet on the quality of life of patients, and they compared it to a SHEM diet. In general, um, they did not find a significant difference in the quality of life, but significant differences were found for the role limitations due to physical health, also energy and fatigue, body image, um, social reaction and also relationships, which indicated that a low FODMAP diet um, reduced the quality of life in these domains. Then the impact of low FODMAP diet on microbiota is also a well-discussed uh, topic. Um, the, uh, the FODMAP diet leads to changes on short term, but what the effect is on long term still needs to be investigated further. Um, they also have an effect on mucosa and submucosa. The, the low FODMAP diet leads to redu reductions in the bifidobacteria, but um, as I said, the effect on long term should be uh, investigated more and also um, the, co the combination with, uh, for example, a probiotic um, on long term should be um, investigated. However, the low FODMAP diet is a very complex uh, diet. It requires a, a good explanation and a good follow-up and uh, by, a, by a skilled and a trained dietitian. Um, that's very important because often um, patients um, cannot um, follow the low FODMAP diet when they are not um, when it's not explained well by by a trained dietitian. So there is probably need also for a simpler FODMAP poor diet which is not so strict as the low FODMAP diet. Therefore, um, they introduced the traditional IBS diet, which is uh, more based on how and when to eat rather than the foods or which kind of food uh, to ingest. Um, the traditional IBS diet is based on National Institute for Health and Care Excellence guidelines and also the British uh, Dietetic Association, also more known as the NICE diet. When this traditional IBS diet was compared to the low FODMAP diet, um, we see um, similar uh, results on the reduction of symptom severity in patients with IBS. Um, so no uh, significant difference was found between the both treatments. On the right uh, graph, you can see a comparison between the low FODMAP diet with a typical Australian diet. And there you see after the baseline period, the low FODMAP diet um, leads to a reduction in uh, symptoms, while the typical Australian diet um, did not show a, a, a reduction um, and it just it, this, the symptom uh, scores stayed the same. It was also, they also looked at um, the effect of uh, the traditional IBS diet and the low FODMAP diet on the dysbiosis index. 
as you see uh, on this slide, so the traditional IBS diet did not change the dysbiosis index um, after the treatment compared to before, compared to baseline. But the low FODMAP diet um, um, in this trial showed uh, to have higher dysbiosis indexes after the, low after the treatment of the low FODMAP diet. In addition, you also see that responders um, had also a lower dysbiosis index at baseline, so this can be an interesting uh, predictor um, for response to the low FODMAP diet. This is one of our um, trials where the FODMAP lowering diet was compared to medication, spasmolytic agents, um, in primary care uh, irritable bowel syndrome patients. So all patients were randomized in two groups. There was one group who followed the simple IBS diet, so less strict than, than the strict FODMAP diet, and this was uh, followed uh, by a smartphone application and the other group uh, was treated by the spasmolytic agent otilonium bromide. The treatment period was eight weeks and all patients were followed up by their physician um, for two times eight weeks. Those are the results of this trial. So um, as you can see, after uh, eight weeks of treatment with both treatments, we found a significant, dif uh, significant um, decrease in symptom score, which was also the primary endpoint of this trial. And even um, when compared the uh, IBS scores after the eight weeks, we found a significant difference between the diet and otilonium uh, bromides. Um, also, when we looked at the percentage of responders to the diet and to otilonium bromide, we found high percentage of response and also a significant uh, difference between both treatments with um, the highest response uh, rate in the diet group. So, as I discussed before, the low FODMAP diet first starts with a strict diet phase from 4 to 8 weeks. And then afterwards, there is the reintroduction phase, which is still uh, very difficult also for patients to follow. And um, yeah, it's a, a challenging phase of the FODMAP diet. Afterwards, um, then um, it, they look at the uh, triggers, the FODMAP triggers, and they set up a personalized uh, diet, which they can follow for a longer period. But as I said, the reintroduction is very challenging, um, also um, ineffective, ineffective often and often incomplete um, by the patients. Therefore, we set up another um, trial also in IBS patients where we wanted to focus on the reintroduction phase. So first of all, patients started with a baseline period where they filled out questionnaires and also stool diaries. Afterwards, there was the six weeks, six weeks strict diet, low FODMAP diet, um, and then um, they were reintroduced to several FODMAPs, six FODMAPs for um, and they were tested for a week, um, and there was also glucose as a control. Um, they were re reintroduced to those uh, FODMAPs by powders, which they added to their meals three times a day. It was a blinded approach, so uh, the patients did, does not know, do not know um, which FODMAPs they are testing uh, at which time point. Afterwards, um, they go again to the dietitian, and there is a personal diet which is set up based on their symptoms um, which they scored to, during the reintroduction period. Those are preliminary results of this trial. So um, for now, on 11, uh, those are the results of 11 patients. And as you see, first of all, um, the strict diet reduced the symptom severity. Um, but then later on, uh, during the reintroduction phase, we see significant increases um, on the, the symptom severity for lactose, mannitol, but the most significant for fructans. We um, also set up the same trial um, as the, the, the FODMAP diet for the IBS patients, but in functional dyspepsia patients, because we also see a huge overlap between um, the patients with IBS and also functional dyspepsia symptoms. Those patients filled out also uh, questionnaires and diaries, the Leuven postprandial distress um, symptom diary, uh, which focuses here, the score focuses on postprandial fullness, early satiation and bloating, the most uh, dominant symptoms in those uh, functional dyspepsia patients. 
A uh, difference of 0 0.5 is clinically, clinically meaningful. So as you can see, compared to baseline, we saw a significant um, decrease in the um, LPDS score. But also these, those patients are reintroduced by all FODMAPs and by glucose. And you see that um, there are higher numbers um, on the LPDS score compared to the end of the strict diet phase. Those are some individual responses to the diet. So um, as you see here, for example, the second graph, which is, which is shown on this slide, it's from a patient who reacted on the fructans and fructose, and also, um, but not that high on mannitol. So for this patient, um, it set up a personalized diet together with the dietitian um, to still restrict fructans and fructones, fru uh, fructans and fructose, but to um, reintroduce again the other um, FODMAPs in their diet. Another um, hot topic is um, gluten. Is it gluten or is it wheat? So um, wheat is, um, contains gluten, but also non-gluten proteins um, and also fructans, so a FODMAP. It's a well-discussed topic, so I, I discussed already several parts of this um, slide before. The effect of food on gastrointestinal symptoms, and as you also see, the gluten is also one of um, is also part of this uh, slide, um, which also leads to higher um, IBS symptoms. This is a trial where they compared a gluten-free diet with a gluten-containing um, diet, and as you see, there is a significant um, decrease in the frequency of stool uh, of stools a day in those patients. Um, there are also some changes in the form and the passage, but th those were not uh, significant. However, so the gluten-free um, diet is a very, um, also a very hot topic and a, a, even a hype. Um, as you see the numbers here uh, indicated on the slide, 24% um, has a family member on a gluten-free diet, but also in Australia, 11% of adults uh, avoid bread and 40% um, are, are on a gluten-free diet. Even children in New Zealand, and um, yeah, those are really high numbers. When um, they um, set patients f um, uh, on a FODMAP diet, you see here, after a baseline, they found a significant difference based on the FODMAP diet. And after the uh, two weeks FODMAP diet, they were um, randomized into groups. They, uh, they um, introduced a high gluten, low gluten, or placebo um, in addition to their uh, low FODMAP, uh, to their FODMAP diet, and significant differences were found for the overall symptoms for pain, um, for satisfaction with stool consistency um, and flatulence, uh, not for pain but for bloating, um, but with a high uh, nocebo effect. Um, and this study maybe indicates also that um, it's maybe more the effect of FODMAPs um, compared uh, or more the effect of FODMAPs than gluten which leads to um, a reduce in their symptoms. Or, uh, yeah. So um, the non-celiac uh, gluten sensitivity, uh, so patients with um, the non-celiac gluten sensitivity are patients without the celiac celiac disease, but who still have symptoms, um, and symptoms um, have improved on a gluten-free diet. This is um, a review where they looked at the prevalence of uh, celiac disease in patients with uh, dyspepsia, but uh, they could not find um, significant differences in the prevalence compared to healthy volunteers. And then um, last, I want to focus on the food allergy, which is also a hot a topic right now. Um, so there are high rates of undetected food allergy, allergies in patients with IBS. Um, and so th there is a live detection via the confocal laser. laser endomicroscopy, which is also shown on this uh, nice figure. Um, when uh, 
patients uh, were um, exposed to uh, food antigen antigens, um, they immediately, this immediately leads to an increase in the lymphocytes and um, patients where those changes were observed were set on an elimination diet and as you see on the graph um, this elimination diet, so the CLE uh, positive uh, group um, um, had really a decrease in their symptom score. So this um, goes to the conclusion of my presentation. So dietary factors play an important role in symptom onset. Um, there is the effect of the FODMAP diet, but maybe also need for a simpler FODMAP poor diet. We still have to focus on the reintroduction phase of the low FODMAP diet and maybe use it also in other functional gastrointestinal disorders as functional dyspepsia. And to end with, I want to say maybe gluten-free diet is just a hype. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Karen. We have time for a few questions. First question is, you alluded that the FODMAP diet as currently used is complex, requires a dietitian, is very restrictive, and then you have the difficult reintroduction phase to, to decide what was relevant and what was not in the elimination phase. One of the concerns is also that it is so restrictive that weight loss occurs uh, in patients uh, who are on a FODMAP diet. Mm -hmm. Is this something we see in clinical practice and, and, and how should you deal with it? Is it something to take into account? So we, um, in the trials that we are setting up um, here in, at UZ Leuven, we are also asking uh, the patients uh, for their weight, um, so at baseline, and every two weeks of the strict diet phase we also call them to ask for their weight to see if they don't have um, weight loss. Um, but actually it's, it's just one or two kilograms, but not more uh, than this. So in our studies, we do not find really uh, an impact on the on the weight on yeah the weight of the patients. Yeah, you showed the study where the Nice diet and the FODMAP diet was compared, and there actually they calculated that people went down to as low as 1,600 calories per day in that study. So. Is there any precaution? To, why doesn't it happen then in the patients that you are following? What, what's the difference? Do you know? Do you have an idea? Um, we are also collecting data on um, the calories, the calorie intake, but this still needs to be um, looked at, so I don't have results on this. Um, but um, I think, yeah, the, the explanation of the dietitian mm -hmm. is really important, and also in our trials we really um, say to patients that they can contact um, the dietitian if they don't know what to eat, they, have, um, they get alternatives, they get a, a manual which they can use at home. Um, so I think this is really important um, and that they are really followed up very well. So the dietitian's input on that aspect is, is very important. Mm -hmm. And then you show the Domino trial mm -hmm. where the diet is delivered as an app. Mm -hmm. So. How does it work compared to the dietitian? Does the app explain the basis of the diet or, or how does it really work? Because there no dietitian is, is involved and, 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 and we just said the diet is very complex. What does the app do? Yeah, um, so the app is more based on, on a FODMAP lowering diet, it's not uh, the strict low FODMAP diet. Um, there in the app it's also yeah, a combination of um, a FODMAP lowering diet and a NICE diet. It's more some guidelines that we give to patients where we explain um, how often they have to eat three times a day, that they can eat snacks. Um, we also give them some recipes um, and, and some tips, um, some alternatives as well. Um, so I think here um, we see yeah, an, an enormous impact on the symptom severity of those patients, but I think this is just because it's not, um, the diet is not explained as a really strict diet, it's more some, some tips, some, some guidelines um, to, to yeah, change their food habits. So we have a question here, if you do not have access to a good dietitian who knows this, how do you explain and manage the low FODMAP diet? Maybe an app like that could work. 
is there anything available internationally or what will happen to your app at some point? Mm -hmm. Um, yes, um, indeed, that's a good question. So the um, Monash app is also available for patients um, and there they can really type in um, a kind of food and then they see uh, which um, FODMAPs um, are in that kind of food. Um, I also hear from patients that this is really helpful and um, that this is yeah, a good manner to, to follow the FODMAP diet without and the help of a dietitian. Do you have data on compliance to the low FODMAP diet, advised by a dietitian? How many people drop out and how many do adhere? Do you have an idea of that? Well, based on our trials, um, we do have data. We did not uh, looked at it yet because um, those are also preliminary results. But we see that um, patients um, are, are really strict to the diet and that yeah because they have uh, reduced in their symptoms they also want to follow it and um, yeah we, we have a high response to the diet so I think this motivates also the patient to continue with the diet um, and yeah to be adjusted. so in in our setting not a lot of compliance problems no. <laughs> okay thank you I think uh, that will bring us to the next talk which you may introduce okay so the next uh, talk is about the management of chronic constipation and this will uh, again be given by Professor Van Uitzel. Thank you very much Karen. And so now we will shift to a related topic which is the management of chronic constipation which is also, as you know, one of the more frequent disorders that you see in your clinical practice. So, constipation is a frequent condition. When you look at the pooled prevalence uh, around the globe, this is, there is a 14% um, prevalence of constipation. If you follow the stricter Rome 3 and Rome 4 criteria, which are very similar, this will drop to 7%. Similar to irritable bowel syndrome, there is a um, two-fold higher um, prevalence um, in females compared to males and so this is a frequent condition that you see quite often in your practice. So what is chronic constipation? The first step when you see a patient is the clinical history taking and so you need to make sure that you and your patients are on the same line and so chronic constipation can be infrequent stools, can be hard consistency, can be straining, can be an incomplete evacuation of the stools, can be the need for manual maneuvers to defecate, blockage and so on. And of course it's quite important to distinguish between these symptoms because the management will also differ um, whether you have a slow transit constipation or whether the, there is obstructed defecation or dyssynergia. So it's important to address these symptoms carefully and that you are both on the same page. Again very useful in this perspective is the use of the Bristol stool form scale where um, as discussed with IBS the Bristol stool form scale type 1 and type 2 those are the um, subtypes that are associated with constipation so the separate heart lumps or the lumps um, clumped together in a sausage shaped stool so the next step that um, is you need to address is whether there is any need for further evaluation. Do you need a colonoscopy in these patients? Do you need imaging? And this again, this depends on alarm signs and symptoms. Furthermore, is this a case of primary constipation where there is no obvious cause underlying the symptoms or is this a case of secondary constipation? What was the timing of onset? Is this a patient who already suffered from constipation since a childhood? or is this only onset um, as an adult? Was this, did, the, did the symptoms start after intake of medication or after the delivery of a baby, um, which was quite difficult? All these aspects need to, be, need to be taken into account when you um, evaluate the patient with constipation. What is the fiber intake? Is there a decent amount of fiber? Is there too little, too much, and so on? And also the abuse history. Um, should be taken into account. I put it between brackets because this is not something that you usually address in your first consultation, but it's important to keep this at the back of your mind because we know that especially patients with obstructed defecations and outf outflow problem, these are patients with a higher prevalence of abuse history, up to 30% in certain studies. 
So these alarm signs and symptoms, patients who need extra um, investigations, including colonoscopy, are very similar to IBS. Patients who lose weight above the age of 50, blood loss in the stools, anemia. Um, patients with significant abdominal pain is mentioned quite often, but then this goes more in the direction of diagnosis of IBS-C. Patients with familial history of colon cancer and IBD, or of course if you find any lumps or masses upon um, physical examination. Is there any reason to think that this may be medication induced or that this is secondary to, for example, um, changes in the ion concentrations of calcium, for example, or that this is a thyroid problem? These are things that you check. Um, and also, of course, think of constipating drugs. Many drugs can, you, can lead to constipation, including opioids, of course. Opioid-induced constipation is by far the most common type of secondary medication-induced constipation. But all drugs with some anticholinergic um, effects, including um, spasmolytic drugs for bladder spasms, like oxybutynin, um, can cause constipation. Antidepressants, especially the tricyclics, are associated with constipation. Iron supplements, anti-epileptic drugs like carbamazepine, anti-emetics like the um, ondansetron, alosetron, they are very well known to cause constipation, hence they are often, they can be used as well for patients with um, refractory diarrhea. So in these patients, of course, the guidelines state that it's, you have to try to stop these drugs, but as you know, this is not so easy. And so we need to look for other drugs which can help us, especially in patients with opioid-induced constipation. And this is where the peripheral mu um, receptor antagonists come in, or the PAMORAS, like naloxagol. Naloxagol is an orally administered um, antagonist of the mu receptor, the mu opioid receptor, which doesn't cross the blood-brain barrier. And this was evaluated in these two studies, published together in New England Journal of Medicine. And the two doses of naloxagol evaluated, 12.5 and 25 milligrams of naloxagol, um, had high response rates compared to placebo in these patients with opioid-induced constipation. And response here was defined as having at least three complete spontaneous bowel movements per week and an increase of at least one extra per week compared to baseline. So naloxagol is quite useful in patients with opioid-induced constipation and other PAMORAS or um, investigated as well and are coming on the market. So in those patients where there is no evidence for secondary constipation or medication-induced constipation, where there are no alarm signs and symptoms, there's no need to do many other tests and you, you have the diagnosis of chronic functional constipation according to Rome 3 and Rome 4 criteria. These are the Rome 4 criteria and as alluded to in the first slide, um, many symptoms can um, lead to a diagnosis of constipation. This can be straining, at least one-fourth of the uh, bowel movements, lumpier heart stool, so the bristle stool forms scale one or two, incomplete evacuation, the sense of anorectal blockage or obstruction, the need for manual maneuvers to evacuate the stools, all in more than 25 percent of defecation, or having at least or having less than three spontaneous bowel movements per week. And then two other conditions um, need to be fulfilled. So loose stools are rarely present. Many patients with constipation will have some degree of diarrhea once in a while, which is overflow, and they do not fulfill the criteria for IBS. And this means that the pain in these patients is not the predominant feature. Because then if the pain is predominant, and then there are the three associated stool-related um, criteria, then the diagnosis is IBSC rather than functional constipation. Um, treating patients with constipation is again education. Make a proper diagnosis, which here is more easy than in patients with IBS. Tell them about mechanisms of constipation and educate them about lifestyle and dietary measures. And again, fiber can be used, but the fiber paradox. Hope you will not forget this. If you eat too much fiber, there will be increased ferment. And this is also um, part of the FODMAP concept. Many of these fibers are actually FODMAPs and there will be increased pain, bloating and flatulence. So if you want to add a fiber supplement, which can be useful, go for the soluble fiber supplements like psyllium. 
Then for laxatives, um, the first line treatment are the osmotic laxatives and these can be salts like magnesium, um, can be disaccharides which are not digested like lactulose or synthetic osmotic laxatives like polyethylene glycol or macrogol. And often when these osmotic laxatives in sufficient doses with um, sufficient intake of fluids um, are not sufficient, if the patient is refractory to this, then you can add a stimulant laxatives as an add-on. And then potential um, drugs include bisacadyl and sodium picosulfate, which are, which are the diphenolic laxatives, or in some cases the antraquinones like senna. So these osmotics and stimulant laxative, they work. If you look at these meta-analysis, um, you see that they are significantly better than placebo. Um, and one of these um, osmotic laxatives is lactulose. So lactulose is similar to lactose. However, where lactose is a disaccharide um, composed of galactose and glucose, lactulose is a semi-synthetic uh, modification of um, lactose consisting of galactose and fructose. And humans do not have an enzyme which can um, split lactulose in their two um, sugar monosaccharide moieties, and so this cannot be absorbed. And this will, will then be transported to the colon where it will act as an osmotic laxative. So it will attract water and increase the fecal water content, that is one um, mechanism of action. But also lactulose is also a prebiotic, which means that it will be used um, as a substrate by the microorganisms of the host and lead to a health benefit. For example, in this study where lactulose was compared to polyethylene glycol in patients with chronic constipation, you see that with lactulose, which is the light um, shaded bar, there is an increase in the number of bifidobacteria, which are bacteria associated with beneficial health effects, in contrast to a decrease of bifidobacteria with polyethylene glycol. This is also probably why the optimal effect of lactulose only um, is present after four weeks of treatment. So you need to um, continue the treatment for a long enough period. So what are the types of laxatives that people are taking? This is an internet-based survey in 10 European countries with self-reported constipation, more than 1,350 people. And you see that two-thirds of these patients with symptoms of constipation actually reported to take laxatives. And you see the divide here. Um, there's a lot of patients taking macrogol, um, also some patients with antraquinones. Um, some fiber, um, you see that it's, it, it's all over the place. However, if you look at the response and the satisfaction with the laxatives, this is quite disappointing. Only one third of patients or less will um, report it in this internet-based survey that they were actually satisfied or very satisfied with this first line um, laxative. And then almost half of the patients were actually neutral. They're not really satisfied, neither dissatisfied and 25 to 30 percent were um, dissatisfied or very dissatisfied with this treatment. So this shows you that there is a need for additional treatment and more advanced treatment of patients with chronic constipation. And so the guideline states to stop the laxative and start a enterokinetic drug. Um, it depends where you are on which side of the ocean. Um, it's also possible to combine a laxative with a prokinetic drug. Um, which we often do in clinical practice as well. So one of the um, prokinetics which, which can be used is procalopride. Procalopride is an agonist of the serotonin 4 receptor which is involved in the peristaltic reflex and in the peristaltic mass movements of the colon. So when an agonist of the serotonin 4 receptor is given, this will trigger this peristaltic reflex leading to a contraction proximal to the um, fecal material and this will then lead to a propulsion of the fecal material and a relaxation distal to the fecal bolus leading to a possibility to protrude, protrude the fecal bolus um, distally. And so stimulation of the serotonin 4 receptor will then trigger a peristaltic reflex and a colonic mass movement by stimulation of these serotonin 4 receptors. Serotonin for agonists are always looked at a little bit suspiciously because this reminds people of the cisapride um, story where cisapride was a very effective prokinetic. However, this was withdrawn from the market because of 
um, unacceptable cardiac side effects, and mainly this was QT prolongation. And the reason is that this blocked the human um, eater um, agogo-related channel, where this, when this is blocked, this can lead to a prolongation of the QT um, uh, time and lead to torsal de point, so um, life-threatening um, cardiac arrhythmias. However, this is not the case with procalopride. There is no affinity for the human itragogol related channel at all. So this is a safe drug in terms of cardiac safety. This is a meta-analysis combining um, the placebo-controlled trials with procalopride um, of 1 and 2 milligrams a day. And you see that there, the efficacy of, of procalopride in terms of response, so at least having three complete spontaneous bowel movements per week, is 30 to 40% and this is 20% more than placebo. So this is a very effective drug that we use quite often in clinical practice and this effect is both present in females and in males. Looking at individual symptoms, you can see that with procalopride there is a large effect of bloating, discomfort, pain and cramps, so an improvement of all of these, um, a decrease in incomplete um, bowel movements, decrease in false, false alarm straining and so on where this is much less the case with placebo. There are some side effects with procalopride as well. So we know, of course, that this can lead to diarrhea, um, which can be considered a side effect, but this is actually what um, the desired effect would be to, to improve the stool consistency and the evacuation of stool. And we also know, and this is quite important to tell your patients, that in the first one or two days of the treatment, procalopride can induce headache, which can be severe in some patients, and nausea. And you need to tell your patient that it's quite important to continue the treatment and not to stop because in most patients these side effects will disappear over the next few days. Not in all of them, but in many. Procalopride is a prokinetic which works at the level of the colon. However, um, procalopride can also be considered as a pan-GI prokinetic and this um, is also based on findings from our own group. Um, where we published evidence that procalopride also improves gastric emptying, so in patients with gastroparesis, and you saw this last week as well. This was a crossover study where procalopride was given for four weeks, and the symptoms of gastroparesis quantified by the GCSI score um, was decreased to a higher extent with procalopride than with placebo, and it also improved gastric emptying. It was a decrease in nausea vomiting, um, fullness, um, bloating with procalopride in contrast to placebo. So procalopride can be used as an add-on therapy to osmotic laxatives or can be used instead of osmotic laxatives. However, if there is still no adequate relief with osmotic laxatives or with um, the prokinetic drug, then this is a patient with um, refractory constipation. And this of course is a quite frequent presentation in our clinical practice. These are the patients that need to be referred for some function testing in order to get some insights in disease mechanisms which can be addressed um, further down the line. And so in terms of subtyping of the pathophysiology, there are three different subtypes. So first there is a very large group of patients with normal transit constipation. Even if they have in, um, infrequent bowel movements, if the stools are lumpy or hard, if there is a sense of incomplete evacuation, if you measure the transit time, the transit time is normal. And there is a large overlap and it's very similar to constipation predominant IBS. Then there is a group um, which is more common in women, um, which is a slow transit constipation, which is characterized by um, lower um, colonic motility um, in these patients. And finally, there is a very important group of the obstructive defecation or pelvic floor dysfunction but there's a problem of coordination of the pelvic floor and the anal sphincter. And these different subtypes of constipation can be distinguished by physiology testing, including balloon expulsion tests, transit studies, anorectal manometry, and a defecography. And I will come back to these later on. The important subtype that you want to diagnose at this stage in patients with refractory constipation or those with pelvic floor dysfunction and this is a quite a large group. This, is, um, this consists of 40% of patients with chronic constipation. And it's quite important to diagnose these early on because these are the ones who react favorably to biofeedback therapy. Up to 80% of these patients will have some kind 
um, some level of response to biofeedback therapy versus less than 10% in patients who do not have dyssynergic defecation. And so these can be tested with a balloon expulsion test with anorectal manometry. So balloon expulsion test is a simple test which can be um, office based where you inflate the balloon with 50 mils of water to add some weights to it and the patient is asked to push the balloon out um, similar to what they would do in defecation. So this is a simulated defecation. It's important that you allow some privacy for the patient and that this is done um, in a sitting position. We know that this is much harder when they are on the left lateral position on the bed when you are sitting behind them. So please allow some privacy, do it on the commode um, after cur uh, behind the curtain or on the toilet. And a normal balloon expulsion of 50 mil would be within one minute. So the positive predictive value is 64%, which is fine but not great. However, there is a very high negative predictive value, which means that if a patient can expel the balloon rather easily or do it within one minute, you know that the probability of having an outflow problem or obstructive defecation is quite low. And so you do not need to send the patient for biofeedback therapy if there is a normal balloon expulsion test. If you do not have the options to do this test, even if it's quite easy, you can also um, use your finger and do a DRE where you can ask the patient again to, um, to squeeze, to relax, you can assess the resting tone in a relaxed um, state and you can also ask them to bear down and to try and squeeze your finger out. Also here, um, the sensitivity is quite good, so there is a good negative predictive value, but the positive predictive value is quite low because there is a problem of social inhibition and many patients will paradoxically contract the external anal sphincter even if everything is normal. So anorectal manometry can help you to make a diagnosis of a um, dyssynergic defecation. Um, and anorectal manometry is useful to assess the resting pressure and squeeze pressure of the external anal sphincter, which is the majority, which makes up the majority of the uh, anal sphincter tone. You can also test the um, sensitivity of the rectum by inflating the balloon and testing sensitivity. And also quite important, especially if the patient has very severe constipation or if the patient has already constipation since a childhood, you can also test the rectoanal inhibitory reflex. So this is a reflex pathway which is triggered by balloon distension of the rectum and this leads to a reflexive, uh, reflective relaxation of the anal sphincter. If this does not take place, this is suspicious for a presence of Hirschsprung's disease which need then to be confirmed by um, deep rectal biopsies and tests for the absence of um, ganglia. So what can you see with anorectal manometry in, in the case of uh, dyssynergia? You can see variable um, combinations of rectal and anal sphincter pressure. This is high resolution manometry, but always there is either a higher contraction of the anal sphincter, which is paradoxical, because when you open your bowels, when you bear down, there needs to be a relaxation of the anal sphincter complex, or there is no proper relaxation of the anal sphincter during defecation. And this can then be associated with or without increased rectal pressure. So interestingly, when you compare the anorectal manometry between healthy volunteers, so who do not have any symptom of constipation with patients with functional constipation, you see that, for example, a type 1, so increased um, contraction of the external anal sphincter combined with increased rectal contraction, that this was actually more frequent in healthy volunteers compared in, to patients with functional constipation, indicating that a diagnosis of dyssynergia or dyssynergic defecation on manometry is not an end diagnosis. And you always need to combine the findings of manometry together with other tests, for example, balloon expulsion tests, but also with the clinical picture. Um, for example, is there a need for, for um, manual maneuvers to expel the stools? Is there a feeling of, of anal blockage? Is there incomplete evacuation? And so on. So interestingly, in this study, you see that only 9% of healthy individuals had a normal anorectal manometry, which questions the um, making a diagnosis just based on anorectal manometry. So, you have balloon expulsion tests, you have anorectal manometry, so if you can combine this with a third test in case of doubt um, or discongruent findings, you can also use difficography. 
This can be done with barium, um, so the classical difficography like you can see here, or you can also use an MR, a magnetic resonance difficography as, as well, without the radiation exposure. So patients are, um, pictures are being taken in resting position, they're asked to squeeze, um, where you see an increased tone here at the level of the sphincter, straining and then defecating. And in this patient, for example, you see the appearance of this rectal seal. Um, and this is quite important because with your anal ectomanometry and a balloon expulsion test, you cannot make a distinction between anatomical abnormalities, for example, a rectal seal or even a, a, a tumor, and functional abnormalities. But similar to manometry, um, also here there is a big problem of social inhibition. As you can imagine, um, when you have to open your bowels sitting on a commode in front of a um, radiological um, equipment. So this is the difficulty of diagnosing patients with the defecatory disorder. So this is a Venn diagram showing the results of balloon expulsion tests, defecography, anorectal manometry. So there is a variable degree of overlap and there is not really a gold standard. So this is a difficulty and um, just a um, word of, of caution not to make a diagnosis just based on one test. So if both the balloon expulsion and anorectal manometry are abnormal, you can diagnose defecatory disorder and you send the patient for um, biofeedback therapy. If it's inconclusive, you're not really sure, you suspect that there may be an anatomical lesion, um, you go for barium or MR defecography and then you treat based on your findings. However, if the, there is no sign of a defecatory disorder, then you measure a colonic transit and you can distinguish between slow and normal transit defecation. So what you use for this is a, um, a pellet test or modified Metcalf method like we use. So radio opaque markers are um, given to the patients and the, the method that we use is a modified Metcalf method where you give 10 radio opaque markers per day over the course of six days and you um, perform an x-ray on day seven. You count the number of markers, you multiply by 2.4 and you have the colonic transit time and you see the normal values here. Um, Importantly, the late colonic transit is only there when it's more than 65 and even if you think about surgery, which I will come back later on, you need to, make, you need to put the cutoff even higher, above 100 hours. Um, we believe it's important, and this is published, that you go for this six-day method rather than giving just one set of pellets once. Um, because this is similar to what happens with medication, you need to provide some time in order to, to get an equilibrium between defecation and intake of the pellets to have a um, confident assessment of the um, colonic um, transit time. You can also look at the location of the pellets. If it's all over the colon, this, is, this can be slow transit constipation. When it's just in the rectum, this is suggesting this energy defecation. However, be aware that um, even if you measure slow transit, this can still be dysenergic defecation um, as a response to the problem at the outflow. These are some of my patients. For example, 37 pellets here. It's a transit time of 88 hour, hours, which is moderately delayed. And this was a patient who had all the 60 pellets still there um, after one week. And you can see that there is important coprostasis all over the colon. So in these patients, um, novel treatments can be used, for example, the um, chloride secretagogues like lubiprostol, which is a direct chloride channel activator, or lenaclotide. Lenaclotide using a similar mechanism as the enterotoxin of E. coli or Yersinia, which will produce cyclic GMP. So cholera produces cyclic AMP, this produces cyclic GMP. And this then leads to an activation of the cystic fibrosis um, transmembrane conductance regulator or CFTR um, chloride channel leading to chloride secretion and hence water will be attracted to the lumen and this will then um, improve stool consistency. So there's a dual effect because of the chloride secretion and the water this leads to an anti-constipation effect. Secondly, and this is mainly based on animal studies, the cyclic GMP will diffuse to the subepithelial space and have an anti-nociceptic effect on subepithelial neurons, which is hold responsible for the pain-reducing efficacy of lenaclotide. This is also shown in this phase 3 study, um, published in the Red Journal, where there is an 
almost immediate improvement of the number of spontaneous bowel movements per week, six or seven per week with lenaclotide compared to two or three with placebo, and a slower onset of a decrease in abdominal pain with lenaclotide compared to um, placebo. So what happens if, no, if everything fails? Then um, surgery can be considered. However, I want to warn you that the um, outcome is very difficult to predict because in some patients this can then lead to um, incapacitating diarrhea, um, bloating and so on. So the outcome is, is, is definitely not um, sure if you send patients for surgery. So the two things that you need to be aware of is that if you are thinking or considering surgery, you need to exclude that this is a primary pan-gastrointestinal motility disorder. And so especially small bowel manometry has a place here in, in um, these patients to exclude that this is a case, for example, of chronic intestinal pseudo-obstruction, where the constipation is just one um, phenomenon, and so which will not be addressed by performing a subtotal colectomy. And, as advised in the guidelines, a colonic manometry, high-resolution colonic manometry, can be useful to demonstrate colonic inertia. However, this is in all the guidelines, but only very few centers around the globe have this available. And so, it's still unsure whether this really predicts a beneficial or a detrimental outcome after surgery. So, we do this. Um, in clinical practice and in research. So we are looking whether this can predict the outcome after surgery. And this is the way we do this. We clip a high-resolution manometry probe to the um, pseudocecum around the ileocecal valve, which you see here, together with a perfusion tube. Um, so all around the colon. Here it, it's, um, the manometry probe is um, clipped at the level of the hepatic flexure, but usually we try to go to the, um, to the cecum. And then we look at the response of the colon to a meal, and we also look at the response to um, bisacadyl, for example. And in this patient, you see that there is a um, presence of these high amplitude propagating contractions after bisacadyl is giving intraluminally. In this patient, nothing happens. So this is a case of colonic inertia, which is defined by an absence of um, colonic um, pressure phenomena with bisacadyl and a meal. So the standard type of surgery is the subtotal colectomy with an iliorectal anastomosis in case colonic inertia has been diagnosed. Um, but as I told you, this is not for your average patient. Be aware, this is only for the highly refractory patient and in a highly selected um, number of patients. Thank you. Thank you, Tim. We have a couple of questions uh, to address. First, two that I would like to add together about the diagnosis of constipation. So um, let me go down a little bit in the list here. We, we, we got a lot of questions already. Maybe we can also address some during the cases later on. Yeah, so uh, we'll do a few questions and we go to the cases. So one is, um, is the frequency of stool three to four times a week, is this constipated? And a second one, do you ag agree with Robert Heglin's definition of constipation? Constipation is the absence of defecation for 24 hours. So, if the patient has three to four defecations a week or two defecations a week and the patient is happy, well, then it's not the patient, but if the patient doesn't report symptoms or doesn't seek medical care, this is not constipation. So this has to be bothersome, this, there has to be an impact on daily life. However, if the patient comes to me and says, well, I have two to three defecations a week and this is bothersome for me, well, this is functional constipation um, by definition. I do not agree um, by the definition that was mentioned, which actually I didn't know. Neither did I. Um, <laughs> um, if a, it is perfectly fine if you don't have defecation every 24 hours. Even if this can be bothersome for some patients, patients with IBS who do not defecate every day, this can be bothersome for them, but this is not functional constipation diagnosis. Is a low FODMAP diet indicated in patients with chronic constipation? That's a good question indeed. If patients have IBS, which is constipation predominant, uh, the FODMAP diet can be used also in patients with um, constipation predominant IBS. Because if the transit is delayed, of course you will have more time for fermentation and this can then lead to the negative effects of 
high FODMAP intake. And in these patients, a low FODMAP diet can help as well, but always combined with measures to um, alleviate constipation as well, so osmotic laxatives and um, prokinetics. But in patients who have refractory bloating and pain, additional low, low FODMAP diet can help as well. There's two more questions that I would like to join, and then we go to the cases and we see how much time left is left. Question one, how long can you use stimulant laxatives? Question two, how effective are enterokinetics in the long term? Is the effect of uh, procalopride persistent over time? Yeah, um, good, good question. So the stimulant laxatives are not given on a daily basis in, uh, in our practice. So the standard everyday treatment is an osmotic laxative and a stimulant laxative is added two, three, four times a week. Um, and this can be continued, continued for a longer period of time. So I have patients who are on this for several years, this is fine. Of course, after six months we try to taper and to stop and see what is the outcome. But many of these difficult to treat constipation patients, they will need a prolonged treatment and that is okay. I am not worried about long-term um, negative effects of these stimulant laxatives on colonic motility, which is well described. However, if patients are refractory to, to all kinds of treatment and you will end up in a situation of surgery, I'm perfectly happy with continuing a stimulant laxative. Um, and for the enterokinetics like procalopride, um, there are no data, but in clinical practice you can treat these patients for several years with ongoing effects. In some patients you do lose a response. What I do is then I switch, for example, from procalopride to lenecletide. Um, if they lose response to this as well, sometimes I, I switch back or I combine both because they have a different mechanism. So this, this requires some creativity of, um, of the gastroenterologist. Okay, I think we can move to the cases. Okay, so well, there are a couple of cases on constipation and also on IBS, so we will um, address certainly some more questions. And feel free to ask more questions and then um, Jan will interrupt and ask these questions. So the first case is a young woman of 28 years old um, who comes to you with pain in the left lower quadrant and bloating, which is already there since more than 10 years, and there is important flatulence, which is socially, socially disturbing. So she describes a mixed stool pattern, so she has diarrhea up to five times a day, but on other days there is no defecation, sometimes she only has uh, two to three defecations per week. She mentions that pain levels are higher during defecation, but then immediately afterwards the pain is better. She also describes heartburn twice a week, especially when she eats heavy meals. She lost two kilograms in the last year. Um, she um, attributed this to stress at her work, but now her weight is stable. She denies symptoms during the nights, and she actually reports that she had similar symptoms four years ago, and she came to see another physician. She was treated with mebeverin, she was fine, she was treated with three to four months, then she stopped it and she was okay. This was restarted by her GP, however, this time the symptoms are still there, so mainly pain, bloating, and altered stool pattern. We discuss the psychosocial history. She mentions a difficult divorce two years ago. She works as a secretary, which is stressful. There have been some changes at work which um, have uh, upset her. And indeed, during the weekend, she experiences less symptoms, which we often see. She does not smoke, she doesn't drink. And her medical history includes an eating disorder as a teenager, for which she had um, psychiatric therapy, but now she, is, she denies that this still plays a role. Um, she had an appendectomy in 1995 and a cholecystectomy in 2005. So she has a BMI on the lower end of the spectrum. The abdomen is um, sensitive upon palpation, but there is no um, peritoneal signs. So the first question is, what is this history most suggestive of? Is this IBSD, centrally mediated abdominal pain syndrome, food allergy, celiac disease or parasitic infection? Um, we don't have time to wait for the answers, but of course, because there is a clear relationship between the pain and the physiological process of defecation, this is most suggestive of IBSD. However, as you know, we cannot exclude that this is also a case of celiac disease. Food allergy is um, less likely um, because she denies any extra intestinal symptoms. So what would you do otherwise? What do we need as additional testing? She is a young person 
without red flags um, to the way it is now stable, there's no familial history. Um, so what we did in this patient is we did serology for celiac disease, um, which was negative. We ran some limited blood tests, which were negative. There was no inflammation whatsoever. And we did a fecal calprotectin, which was negative as well. The lactose breath test is mentioned as well. This came up during the questions um, at the end. Um, I don't want to go into detail, but I don't do a lot of lactose breath tests anymore because usually it's more than just the lactose which is causing the symptoms. And it's only in a minority of patients where a lactose um, limiting diet is, is helpful. So nowadays we use the FODMAP or the FODMAP light concept to treat these patients and we don't do lactose breast testing anymore. Almost not. So one of the things that, that people are often worried about and, and a reason, a big reason why people are still doing colonoscopies even in young patients is microscopic colitis. However, what you can see here is that microscopic colitis is, is very rare in young patients and below the age of 50 this is quite rare. Um, however, in patients with refractory diarrhea, you, you tested a couple of different treatments and the patient still comes back with incapacitating diarrhea, well then of course you can consider to do colonoscopy with biopsies, but not upon first diagnosis. Patients with um, nocturnal stools, weight loss, um, recent reintroduction of drugs, recent onset of diarrhea and known autoimmune disorders. These are all risk factors for microscopic colitis. But so there is no need to do a colonoscopy um, to take biopsies in all patients. Also, if you do the colonoscopy, take biopsies left and right sided, otherwise you will miss 25% of patients with um, microscopic colitis. So we did the tests like discussed, they were all normal. So what is the treatment that you would start? You can use a spasmolytic drug, antibiotics, peppermint oil, loperamides, low FODMAP, eloxadoline, antidepressants and cholesteramine. Um, what we did was we started with a spasmolytic drug and loperamide as needed, as discussed, but be aware loperamide will not address the pain. Um, because the patient had a cholecystectomy, we were suspicious that maybe this was a patient where there was a, a degree of bile acid malabsorption. And indeed what we found was that there was an increased presence of bile acid excretion in the feces. So what we did was we added cholestyramine, two sachets per day. Um, there was some intolerance with bloating. And then we added cholecephalam. Um, which is often tolerated better as discussed. 625 milligrams QID and diarrhea was better indeed, so there definitely was a factor of bile acid malabsorption, but the pain was still there. She was included in a phase 3 trial with ebastin, no improvement, also not during open label extension. So what could be a next step? As discussed by Karen extensively, a low FODMAP diet could be useful in these patients. Um, and this was effective indeed. She felt less bloated, the flatulence was reduced, and she had a more regular stool pattern. But again, the pain was refractory. The pain was still very bothersome. So the next thing that we do was to add amitriptyline, low dose in the evening, 10 milligrams. We explained her why we do this, not to treat an underlying depression, but to tackle the pain. We increased to 25 milligrams at night. This was combined by a modified low FODMAP, so after reintroduction, and combined with loperamide as needed. And this combination therapy was effective in this patient. So this was a step-by-step -step approach leading to this um, combined therapy. And I also addressed in this case the possibility of having a bile acid malabsorption in this patient. Very nice. I think we have time for, for one more question. Uh, case yes so before we, we go into the break perfect so now we move to a case of constipation this is a six a 56 year old cleaning lady who comes to you with long um, duration constipation which is already there since adolescence she um, opens her bowels once um, per week or sometimes once every three weeks and the stools are quite lumpy so bristle stool form scale type 1 she has progressive bloating and pain, but only in the last few days before defecation. So the pain is not predominant. 
She tried lactulose, she failed on this, she had glycerin suppositories because there was some um, suggestion of obstructive defecation as well, because um, she, she really had to, to squeeze um, before she could defecate. She used paraffin oil, she, she used procalopride as a prokinetic, she all failed on this. Her medical history was remarkable for a hemorrhoidectomy a um, couple of years back, and now she is on an osmotic laxative, macrogol, two sachets per day, and she uses large enemas twice per week, administered by a home care nurse. So again, bristle stool form scale type 1, once every week or once every three weeks, so severe constipation. So most suggestive of, I don't think this is difficult, this is chronic constipation, the pain is not predominant, um, so it's most likely chronic constipation. You do a colonoscopy because of the refractory condition of constipation, because of the, the age as well, and you find a dolichocolon colon um, in this patient and you also see this dark leopard-like pattern and in biopsies this is pseudomelanosis um, secondary to the use of senna. So then we did some physiological testing. We, used, we did a defecography. Um, we also did an anorectal manometry and a balloon expulsion test, but this is hidden behind the picture. They were normal. Um, and we did a defecography, which was normal as well. A, we sent her Sorry, I made a mistake. The anorectal manometry showed some dyssynergic defecation, so there was a paradoxical contraction of the external anal sphincter. But then, balloon expulsion test was normal, defecography was normal, but still, because there were some doubts, we sent her to the physiotherapist, but she told us this is not the case of a defecatory disorder. She relaxes her external anal sphincter perfectly fine during the simulated defecation. So then we tested the transit time, and Similar to the patient I showed you before, all 60 pellets were still there on day 7. So this is a very long transit time, more than 144 hours, which is the maximum we can measure with this type of um, transit test study. If you really want to know the, the accurate transit time, you need to do this for a longer period, for 2 to 3 weeks, but this is not really useful. You know that this is a severely delayed um, colonic transit time. So diagnosis, refractory slow transit constipation. Um, we increase the therapy with lenaclotide, so with a new type of um, laxative drug, chloride channel activator, no effects of the standard dose. We combined lenaclotide with procalopride, so lenaclotide as a chloride, secretagogue, procalopride as a prokinetic, no effect whatsoever. And then we use the more exotic type of treatments in this patient, so we use pyridostigmine once in a while, so an old prokinetic, which is a cholinesterase inhibitor, increasing the availability of, pro of, colon of acetylcholine in the synaptic cleft. Quite a high dose, 3 times 60 milligrams, no effect. And we went for large volume water enemas, glycerin enemas, um, which we often use in patients to stimulate defecation. However, the patient said this only increased her bloating and the only thing she evacuated was water, but she still felt very distended, very bloated. So this is a very difficult case of constipation, refractory to all kinds of treatments. And so we sent her for colonic manometry. However, there was no case of colonic inertia. So she had normal high amplitude propagating contractions when pesacadil was given intracolonically. The patient is desperate. We tried everything we could. She doesn't want to continue like this. This is unbearable. has an important negative effect on her quality of life. She asks for a definitive solution. And after a very long discussion um, between the two of us, discussing also with surgeons, we sent her for surgery because we didn't see any other option. So because this was a proven slow transit constipation, the only thing that was against doing the surgery was the absence of colonic inertia. So she had the subtotal colectomy with an iliorectal anastomosis. And when I saw her back six months later, she actually was doing very well. She had three normal bowel movements per day, sometimes a bit loose, but this was not disturbing. There was some limited bloating left and no pain. So this is just to show you that in a highly selected patient, surgery can be an alternative to combine can be one solution, but really a last resort solution 
But again, I want to warn you, this doesn't um, go this way in all patients. Some patients will be worse off after surgery. So be careful when sending a patient, but sometimes it can help. Very nice. Two short questions before we go into the break. What is the effect of exercise on IBS symptoms and on constipation? So we know that um, physical exercise in IBS um, helps and improves quality of life and improves the pain level. So there's some evidence of that in the literature. Um, we recommend this in chronic constipation as well. But as far as I'm aware, there is not really a study addressing um, physical exercise in constipation. There's evidence in IBS, but I don't think there is in constipation. Mm -hmm. And then last question, cannabis oil and pain in IBS, any role? Um, difficult question, and like you, we see many patients who have tried um, cannabidiol oil um, for pain and some patients will tell us this is the miracle drug, other patients there is no effect. However, I want to warn you that there's almost no data out there in literature, so before we embark on putting everyone on cannabis oil, I think we need to do the, the research. Okay, I think that concludes the first session of this morning. We went slightly over time. I think we can reconvene 15 minutes after the hour, um, um, and uh, then we can be starting with the next session. Thank you for your attention and uh, be back in 20 minutes, the ultimately. Thank you. Thank you for being back after the short break. In the previous session today, and actually last week also, you saw a lot of algorithms and explanations. And if you go through these algorithms, they look very, very logical, and it's kind of easy to go from one step to another. However, if you're faced in the clinic with a difficult patient, you don't necessarily have that algorithm next to you and there's a couple of tools that can be used. This is called the Rome Interactive Clinical Decision Toolkit. And on the website of the Rome Foundation there are a couple of um, items that are available um, for purchase like books and so, but the toolkit is one of them. And actually if you want to go into treating a patient there is another aspect that is called the multidimensional clinical profile. Um, that is a book available on it and I will show you what is behind it. Um, the objective of the multidimensional clinical profile is to add a level of individualized characteristics of the patients that help you to make treatment decisions to have reliable categories that speak to clinicians and investigators that are relevant to clinical practice. You can also use it to train fellows and health professionals uh, and includes a couple of items like psychiatric conditions or comorbidities that clinicians can really understand and we use terms from research that are applicable to research and practice. Because the Rome process is a very categorical uh, process. You subdivide the diseases into different categories and you have subcategories, functional dyspepsia, for instance, or nausea vomiting, as shown here, chronic nausea vomiting disorders. And you have an algorithm that you step through and actually it always says, if you have a diagnosis, treat accordingly. But treating is very, very different from one patient to another. Somebody who has nausea two times a week, who is not incapacitated, who is mentally very much at ease, you will treat that patient differently than somebody has nausea throughout the day, from morning to evening, is very anxious, incapacitated by it. Your approach will be different, although the diagnosis may be the same. And that is the idea for the MDCP, because the Rome criteria are categorical classifications. 
They do not necessarily recognize clinically meaningful subsets. They do not take in the dimensionality like severity or coexisting physiology that has been measured. They do not take into account relevant comorbidities like anxiety that may affect your treatment choices. Um, and actually, they may also be part of biomarkers for future further subdifferentiation of patients. And so the multidimensional clinical profile augments the ROM criteria with a couple of patient-specific labels, informations to optimize the treatment. And I will, and I will illustrate this in the next couple of slides. So there are categories now, and the first category is the diagnosis. It is the ROM criteria diagnosis. For instance, chronic constipation. It is symptom-based, but it may include physiological criteria. For instance, functional heartburn requires a pH impedance monitoring on a PPI. And the, the ROM diagnosis is used for clinical trials, but is not enough to guide treatment in clinical practice. There we need to add in clinical modifiers, historical information, physical signs, or testing into clinical subsets that may have an impact. They are not necessarily based on evidence, they follow clinical wisdom and they provide for more specific treatment and um, examples will follow but for instance a clinical modifier might be IBS with a post-infection onset. And then the third one, a very important one, is impact. It looks at how the symptoms have affected the the uh, subject in terms of illness perceptions, illness behavior, and ability to still normally function. And this is usually put together in a very easy question. How much have your symptoms interfered with your daily life? And that could be work, could be school for younger people, could be social activities, self-care, concentration, and performance. And this is categorized in groups as mild, moderate, and severe. Next category, category D, is psychosocial modifiers. That may be common psychosocial diagnosis coming from the DSM classifications like anxiety, depression, somatization, which will color your approach and treatment se selection. And number five would be a physiological modifier or a biomarker that provides more understanding of the physiology or some biological parameter, for instance, that understands the diagnosis better, subcategorizes it in some ways, um, and that could be motility, could be a scintigraphy, could be a biochemical test, with, for instance, treatment implications. So this is the summary of the multidimensional clinical profile. A, categorical diagnosis, this is the wrong criteria. B, a clinical modifier, can be the subtype of IBS, can be whether or not the patient has responded to a FODMAP diet, for instance. Number C, impact, mild, moderate or severe. Number D, comorbidities in the psychosocial arena. And E, psycho psycho physiological dysfunction and biomarkers. Let's go to a case to make this speak. It's an esophageal case. It's a 40-year-old woman who is referred for a refractory heartburn. She has had this already two years. It's a burning sensation behind the lower part of the breastbone, almost daily and mainly during the daytime. So there are no nocturnal symptoms. They are more severe after a meal. And then there's also some bloating in the upper abdomen, some nausea and fullness. The weight is stable. She has a BMI of 23, but she considers the symptoms as severe, if asked, because they, she says they impact on my social life and professional activities. An upper GI endoscopy was performed two years ago when the symptoms started and it showed a grade A or B erosive esophagitis. Esophageal biopsies were obtained which was normal and she tried all available PPIs already at standard and double doses and that did not improve her. The clinician reviews the PPI therapy and dosing times and this was adequate. She took it long enough, at least eight weeks, half an hour to an hour before meals at BID dosing even, so this was okay. She had a high resolution esophageal manometry that showed no abnormality. 
She had a 24-hour pH impedance monitoring on the double-dose PPI and the acid was very well suppressed, acid exposure 0.5%. There was very little reflux, 20 events of which 18 were non-acidic and 2 acidic. And she pushed a symptom marker 7 times and there was no correlation between these 20 reflux events and the pushing of the symptom marker. So, this is heartburn. There was no response to a PPI. The pH monitoring on PPI was normal. There were seven symptom episodes on the pH monitoring not related to the few reflux events detected. That actually gives you the diagnosis of functional heartburn in the Rome criteria. There is a clinical modifier. She had a start of low-grade erosive esophagitis at the start. It's something to keep in the back of your mind because presumably she did have reflux disease, traditional one, but the ongoing symptoms now are not related to ongoing reflux. That's why we call it functional heartburn. The impact on daily activities, you know there was very little reflux, 20 episodes, 0.5% acid exposure, you would almost think this is minimal, but the patient says the symptoms are severe. Psychosocial modifier, we didn't go into that. Is she anxious? anxious? Is she depressed? Does she have a history of any of these? We don't know that. And physiological features, manometry was normal, biopsies were normal of the esophagus, and the pH impedance monitoring on PPI is negative. So you have a couple of treatment options for functional heartburn. Reassurance and explanation will always do it and we can now do this reassuringly based on the low-grade lesions only on the initial endoscopy and the reflux monitoring and we can explain that the long-term course of this does not predispose to severe lesions, bleeding, stricture or cancer. You can use antidepressants because this is presumed to be visceral hypersensitivity um, in the esophagus, driving symptoms not related to reflux. And you can use low-dose tricyclic antidepressants or full-dose SNRIs or SSRIs. The idea is that they treat visceral hypersensitivity, but if this is a patient with comorbid anxiety or depression, we would go to the SSRI where we use a full uh, dose, whereas the low-dose tricyclic is not within the um, antidepressant range. So this gives you an example of some of the impact of the MDCP, the categories, how it might push you to make choices. And there is a book uh, which illustrates um, many, many cases. Um, it comprises algorithms and also has the MDCPs. The algorithms are the next thing that I want to address. The al algorithms are in the book, but it is very annoying to have to open a book or when you're with a patient. It gives you a level of uh, an image of inaccuracy, lack of knowledge, but they are available online. This is, for instance, the nausea vomiting algorithm that I've shown you. This is the IBS algorithm that uh, Tim has shown you, and actually they capture expert knowledge, uh, but you don't have them side by side. And so we actually made these algorithms available online. This is called the Clinical Decision Toolkit. And it captures expert knowledge from the Rome um, experts to create a learning tool. So the algorithms are in there and the MDCP is in there. But it is also a modeling and decision support program. Online, you can directly go to it, I will illustrate it in a minute, and it shows you the decision pathways, and it has some level of flexibility, and it runs on most of the usual devices. And what it does is you, it, we put in the MDCP diagnostic algorithms. You can actually add data uh, to it, and you can go to the toolkit to look for treatment choices. So the system pro processes all the information you have in. It has already a pathway put in, but if you put your patient in, it builds a memory. So the system learns and develops probabilities and weights from past entrants, and Rome experts review it twice a year to update it. And so there are multiple decision steps and input. The profile is looked at, and there is expert review, and that actually generates that over time, 
the pathways improve and the system actually may give you guidance in that case with these characteristics the most often treatment approach for instance was treatment A or B or C. So I will go to the online program now. Um, here we are. And you can go to the toolkit. And it gives you a list of types of disorders. And for instance, for the patient that we discussed, this is an esophageal disorder patient. It is a patient with burning retrosternal discomfort or pain despite therapy. And if you go in there, you get the algorithm. Upper GI endoscopy with biopsies, which we discussed. Reflux testing on PPI, which we discussed. Symptom association with acid or non-acid reflux. It was negative. The manometry was normal, so this actually brings us in the box of functional heartburn. With every step, for instance, with the uh, pH impedance on PPI, you can click and you can get explanation on how this should be done with a reference. And if it's completed, you can click that this was completed. And here we would end up with a diagnosis of functional heartburn. And this is defined as burning retrosternal pain with no symptom relief on PPI in the absence of evidence that reflux or eosinophilic esophagitis is the cause and no major esophageal motor, motor disorders. So this is the steps taken here. And then you can go to treatment. And for functional heartburn treatment, you start with reassurance and explanation perhaps some dietary therapy and if you click here you get some explanation you can go to some of the options in there and then you can go to treatment selection factors and you could go for behavioral therapies or you could choose to go to centrally acting neuromodulators let's say you want to go this way and then you click it and then you have notes on gut-brain neuromodulators, a general note on antidepressants. You have explanations on the SSRIs, the TCAs, on the SNRIs. There's references there and you can actually choose from a list to choose. And you can go for antidepressants and you can say when you started them and so on. So this is a tool that actually brings you to um, to a lot of possibilities. So I'll go back to the presentation now. And we'll try to use this in a case, in a case-based um, iteration. Waiting while the computer system picks up. Here it is, it's a 55-year-old male. He presents with intermittent pain and diarrhea. In the last year, several times a week, he had cramps with loose watery stools and urgency, associated with weakness or fatigue. This all started after a proven A. coli gastroenteritis on a holiday, and he had a history of cholecystectomy three years ago. Symptoms worsen when there is stress and when this causes anxiety. He's married, has two children, and has a lot of uh, stress uh, related, uh, job related stress. He works for the European Parliament um, as, a, as an employee. Symptoms moderately impact on daily activities, but make him irritable towards family and colleagues. Lab testing, including colonoscopy, biopsies, is above the age of 50, CRP, calprotectin, stool culture, even lactose tolerant testing, all normal. He has tried diet, including gluten-free and low FODMAP, no effect. He tried loperamide, he was constipated when taken preventively, and when taken when he had diarrhea, it kicked in too late. He's convinced this is stress and wants counseling for his stress management. Diagnosis here, you have a couple of options, but I think you will all agree that this sounds like IBSD because there's pain and diarrhea. And we can go now to the GI genius. Um, where we should go to the algorithm for IBSD. The 
system is a little bit slow when we switch between uh, programs, but please bear with me. So we go to bowel disorders. And this is a patient with recurrent abdominal pain associated with defecation and disordered bowel habits. And we need to look at history and physical examination. Alarm features, he had alarm features, and if, because he's above the age of 55, and you, so you can do limited screening tests. There's explanation here on that. Um, and we would do, because he's above the age of 50, also the colonoscopy. We did that. None of these were abnormal. And then we end up with a diagnosis of IBS. And then the next step is to evaluate stool consistency. And it's clear that this patient has IBS with mixed bowel habits. Um, there's again the explanation on how you make the diagnosis here. And then we will go for treatment. So treatment, oh sorry, I seem to have clicked the wrong box. It's IBSD, of course, that I need to click. Sorry about that. So treatment of IBSD. What are the initial treatment options? It actually lists diet or low FODMAP diet or lactose restriction. He tried that. Probiotics, antidiarrheals, antispasmodics, glutamine supplement is even in there. Let's take a look at what we can use. Treatment options, choose from a list. Low FODMAP diet, probiotics, antidiarrheals, antispasmodics, glutamine supplement. That's an unusual one. Let's take a look at what this is. Glutamine supplement, single randomized controlled trial. The reference is here, 80% response in active, 6% in placebo. I think this is too good to believe, so we're not going to do that. Let's take a look at um, others. Let's take a look at, for instance, antidiarrheals. Antidiarrheals listed here, probiotics, sorry, antidiarrheals. We have loperamide here. We have gelsectan here, which is a new agent available in, uh, in Europe. And there's a couple of trials in here. The patient actually tried um, already the antidiarrheal. Um, so we could... Sorry, need to make a choice. Um, I'll skip that one. So we've already been through most of these, so let's go to a ineffective effect there and go to the persisting diarrhea here. And we go to this one. And if you've been through the first lines, you have a couple of options. Luminal antibiotics, this is going to be rifaximine. Bile acid binders, that's an interesting one. You already heard from Tim that this is an option that can be used. Um, let's go to the bile acid binders. So, bile acid malabsorption common in IBSD. This patient actually had a cholecystectomy that make him, may make him more va uh, va um, vulnerable to that. So, we will start a bile acid binder. Let's say we start this um, on the 1st of September. And we do not yet know whether it is effective. So I'll go back to the case now. IBSD, we started the bile acid binder. Do we have an additional reason to start it beside the effect that he had cholecystectomy? Definitely, because another variable in this patient was post-infection IBS and a Rome Foundation review on post-infection IBS identified this group as having a very high rate of bile acid malabsorption. So in the multidimensional clinical profile, this is IBS with diarrhea, with modifier, post-infection IBS, and possible bile acid malabsorption because he had a cholecystectomy as well. The impact on daily activities was moderate. He was anxious, and we don't know about modifiers. We had the first line of therapies already looked at. We started now the patient on a bile sequestrant. And the patient returns one month later. 
and actually the diarrhea is better but the pain continues so we need to make a choice here now we'll go back to the GI genius with the given that the pain is not improved switching here again on the uh, to the GI genius so we're on this node now diarrhea is well controlled but pain is not controlled and if we click there now the treatment options that we get are tricyclics, SNRIs or behavioral therapy. Let's take a look what is written about the SNRI. This is a class of agent we did not yet address. Tricyclics we already talked about. You saw a case where a tricyclic was used. So here we go to the SNRIs. If the patient does not tolerate a higher dose of a TCA or the TCA is not effective, you can go to an SNRI which has shown beneficial effects in fibromyalgia and may reduce abdominal pain and improve mood. And the patient was anxious actually. Some evidence that relief is achieved in pain associated with depressive symptoms only of able to relieve the, the abdominal pain, the SNRI, not the diarrhea itself and some kind of recommendations. So we could actually start the SNRI, let's say, on the 30th of September, and you can decide whether it is partially effective or effective, and you go, go back to remain on this treatment node, for instance. So that is one example of one of the um, cases that you can go through in the Rome logic nets. Um, and I think in the interest of time, probably we should stop at this case. Am I correct? E. Yes. Yeah. So, so there is one question that we got, yeah. which is an important one, I think. Is the platform GI Genius, is it free for different users? No, it's not free, but I think it's fairly economic and you can get a low-key starting thing. You can use this in an institution and share it with your fellows, for instance, and it has all of the, let's say, more exotic diagnoses in there as well. Globus, for instance, not so difficult to manage. Functional dysphagia, it gives you guidance for these difficult conditions as well. Mm -hmm. um, maybe briefly, there's one question on cholesteramine. How long we can use this and whether we see any nutritional deficiencies from cholestyramine use? So cholestyramine use, um, we have very few long-term clinical trials in uh, functional GI disorders actually. But we do have data from use after, for instance, ileocecal resection or in, in Crohn's disease or for cancer and so on. And there we actually know that you can use it very easily long-term and that it does not cause any nutritional deficiencies. You need to be vigilant about co-medications because the cholestyramine or colcephalam will sequester bile acids but it will also sequester and bind some drugs. So it is recommended to move any drug intake two hours away from the cholestyramine use. The use is usually in the morning before breakfast um, ingesting and you can do a second dose in the evening and you need to move essential and I think non-essential drugs should not be used so all drug use intake away from the cholestyramine or colcephalam intake. Okay, thank you. Okay, then we come to a quiz which is a uh, way for you to test how